He is risen. There we go. You know it. Hallelujah. Praise God. Thank you for waking up. Uh, we are here because this is a big deal. Resurrection Sunday. This is the, the day that changed everything. And we're so glad that you're here to worship with us. Some of you that are guests and you're like, these people are nuts. Now, here's the problem. Some of you regular members were also looking at some of us as we were nuts. I saw some arms folded like this. Listen, that's okay. That's okay. We're glad. There, this is a big deal for us. We're followers of Jesus Christ, and we are excited about the fact that he is alive, that he is not dead. And this is the day. Every Sunday we celebrate the resurrection, but this day is a day that's set aside to specifically face or uh, focus our attention upon the resurrected Savior, and that's what we're here for. That's why we sing. That's why we raise hands. That's why we get all crazy about it. That's why, because he is alive. And we're glad you're here. My name is Andrew. I'm one of the pastors here at Life. And our church exists that all may know Christ and make him known. So our prayer is that what we see in Scripture, what it means to be a Christian, that you would know Christ and then as a follower of Christ, go make him known. That you have a genuine encounter with Christ today. Now, guests, thank you for being here. If you got... Uh, invited by a friend. Thanks for listening and taking them up on the invite. Even if they promise lunch after, we're still glad you're here and uh, we're pumped to have you. Listen, we call you guests because just like in our house, we love having guests. In our home, we love sitting with you. We love eating with you. We love laughing with you. And then we love at around eight o'clock kicking you out because <laughs> it's time for bed, right? Now listen, we have no expectations in my home that you're going to join the family. There's no drawer set aside in the dresser for you. There's no expectations that your name's going to go on the mailbox. However, today, as guests in this home, we hope that you find a family here. Maybe in some dysfunctional way, you find a family here that is Life Church. And we want you to find a place, a welcome place, a place to call home. And that's, we don't, aren't ashamed to say that. We're not apologizing for that. We're not expecting to kick you out after we're done here. Now, what's cool about this today is that we are gathering with millions of Christians around the world, from every nation and every tongue and every place, celebrating the fact that Jesus is alive. Praise God. Amen? Amen. He is alive, and we are in unison. Yes, different melodies and different songs and different languages, but we are singing together the name of Jesus, who is alive. And this is a huge deal. Like, don't let this miss, or be, don't, don't miss this, or don't let it pass by you without expecting or, or understanding that this is a, a day, a reality, a truth that changed everything. Everything changes if Jesus is alive. In fact, uh, one old preacher said the resurrection is not merely important to the historic Christian faith. Without it, there would be no Christianity. It is the singular doctrine that elevates Christianity above all other world religions. Think about it. No other religion has a day set aside to celebrate the resurrection from the dead of their founder and God in the flesh. The Buddhists aren't meeting to celebrate the rise of Buddha. Islam isn't meeting to celebrate the resurrection of Muhammad. And, and we could go on and on down the line of religions. What sets Christianity apart from all other religions and all other faiths is that we know that Jesus is alive. It's such a big deal. It's such a big deal. We get crazy about it. We sing loud about it. We get excited about it. We put wingtip shoes on, put donut holes out, and picture spots out because it is a big deal because of the reality of death. Now, I don't want to cast a shadow on this for a second, but let's just be honest. The reason why his resurrection is so good is because death is real. There's one thing that every single person in all the world will ever, to have ever lived, has to deal with, and that is the certainty of death. Now, across the world, every person, every religion, every faith, every group of people, every philosopher has developed a way to cope with the reality of and the fears, and the uncertainty, and the pain of death. For all of us, death is like this massive storm that's out in the distance. We can see it, and we are heading towards it on a highway without exits, having to directly drive through it. That's the reality of what we are facing. And Bernard Shaw recognized that the statistics on death are quite impressive. One out of one people die. 
It's standing strong at 100%. Doesn't seem like it's going to waver from there. It matters not if you are rich, if you have a massive uh, portfolio, or if you are poor, living paycheck to paycheck. It doesn't matter if you are powerful and famous or unknown and a servant. It matters not if you live in a palace or in a shack. Death treats every person equally. And it's coming, certainly it is coming, and it will work its way in and through your existence. Now, did you know that God's original will and plan for mankind when he created us was that we would never die? His original plan was that we would live in harmony with him and forever on his creation give him glory in fellowship and harmony with him. That was God's plan. You exist as a long line of humans that were created in the beginning to live forever in his creation, living for his honor and for his glory. However, mankind sinned. And the righteous judgment from a sinless and holy God is the judgment of death. Because of sin and because he is holy, there is a payment. That is why Jesus came. He came to this earth. He lived a perfectly sinless life, and yet he still died. He was crucified on a cross that maybe looked like that. And God, in his divine plan, saw this sacrifice of Jesus to be an acceptable payment for the sin of those who would place their faith in Jesus. Scripture tells us that he saw fit and was pleased to put your sin on him as he took your place in payment for your sin. Now proving to us and the world that Jesus' payment for our sin was accepted and that Jesus possessed the power and authority to pay for our sin and the power over death, he rose again from the dead. He rose again, declaring, I did it. What I offered was accepted. The power of Satan, the power of sin, the power of death no longer has a hold on me. I am victorious over death. It proved to us that Jesus is who he says he is. And for the few minutes that we have this morning... I want you to think about the fact that because Jesus resurrected from the dead and is alive, there is hope. There is hope. In fact, that's similar to the big idea. Put it up there if you would. Because Jesus is alive, there is hope in the face of death. Now listen, I didn't think you came to Resurrection Easter Sunday thinking you're going to hear all about death. That's not where I'm going to spend most of my time. But I just need you to know that what makes light so bright is darkness. And what makes the resurrection so beautiful is the reality of death. The story we're going to read in John chapter 11, if you find your place there. John chapter 11 is where we'll be. We're going to read a story. We're going to get some glimpse into a story of how Jesus brings hope in the face of death. See, that was one of the goals of his existence was to bring hope because death was the result of sin and, and, and his goal was to defeat sin, therefore defeating death. And he brings hope in the face of death. As you face death, as you face the certainty of death or the awareness of death or the pain of death and the mourning of death, know this, Jesus brings hope in that. And many centuries ago, there were two sisters who were grieving the death of their brother. Their names were Mary and Martha. Their brother's name was Lazarus. They were friends of Jesus. Jesus spent some time with these people. He loved them. They were his friends when he was on this earth. And the story goes for context that when Jesus heard that his friend Lazarus has died, Martha had sent a messenger to him to tell him, hey, come quickly, Lazarus has died. He stayed where he was for two more days. When he finally arrived in Bethany, we read that Martha met him and they began to talk. So he didn't hurry to Lazarus' society. He stayed there two more days waiting for the perfect time. And as he approaches the city or the town where this took place, we pick up the story in, in John chapter 11, verse 17. Notice what it says. Listen. Now, when Jesus came, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb four days. Why is that important? Because there was this legend that in the Jewish day, or to the Jews, after a person died, their soul would hang out for about three days. 
Now, there's no reason to believe that biblically is true, but that was their idea. And so that might have been important for him because what they really wanted to emphasize was that his soul had left about a day ago. The soul hangs out for about three days, and after they see no life's coming back, they're like, all right, peace, I'm out. I'm going, I'm going where I need to go. And here Jesus shows up in the fourth day to prove to us that Lazarus is not just dead. He's dead, dead. Like he's all the way dead. So much so that his soul is gone. He's, he's moved on somewhere else. So he comes four days. He was in the tomb. Verse 18, Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles off. And many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to console them concerning their brother. They were a prominent family in the community, so many people came to console them. They probably brought them some casseroles or something, I'm sure. So when Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went and met him, but Mary remained seated in the house. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. I don't know the tone of that. I'm not sure if she was condemning him or on him, like, Lord, had you been here, he would not be dead right now. It's your fault. Or if there was just this, Lord, I know that if you were here, he wouldn't have been dead. But look at verse 22. Even now I know that whatever you ask from God, God will give you. It's a little bit of a religious jargon, but I know, I know, I know. Faith, faith, faith. You're going to do it. I mean, maybe that's what it was, or I don't know. Maybe this was a request. And then, then, then look at what he says to her in verse 23. Jesus says to her, your brother will rise again. And Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. So she's saying, I know Jesus. I know the eschatology. I know the real theology that one day, way out, there's an event coming where my brother will rise again. But notice what he says in verse 25. I want you to draw your attention especially to 25 and 26. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? And she said to him, yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the son of God who is coming into the world. Because Jesus is alive, there is hope in the face of of death. And in our text, Jesus offers hope to a grieving, mourning family. Now, what is hope? Well, hope is the confident expectation of the future based upon the faithfulness of God. That's what he was offering to them. And what we're going to see from this text, specifically from verse 25 and 26, is, is that Jesus possesses the power to offer hope in the face of death. You're facing death. It doesn't matter where you come from, how you got here, what your belief system is. You all, we all have to cope with the reality that death is coming. And I'm here to tell you as a messenger of the word of God to say that there is hope in the face of death. There is a way to face death with hope, and that is through Jesus. In order to offer this hope, Jesus made three, what I call hope-giving statements. Three statements. You got to get today. Like, listen, your brunch or your ham is going to be so much better that the crock pot put out if you understand these truths. So let's get them. Here we go. Offering hope in the face of death. Jesus, number one, presents a claim. I want you to see that in verse 25. He makes this statement. He says, I am the resurrection and the life. I am the resurrection and the life. What in the world is going on here? Well, This is one of seven I am statements that Jesus makes recorded in the book of John. He is saying I am, and we see that as a connection, a dot connection back to Exodus when Jehovah God tells Moses to tell Pharaoh, I am sent me. This is Jesus declaring seven times his connection to deity, the power of Jehovah. He is Jehovah. And then he adds something to that to show us what he's meaning. I am, he says, the bread of life. I am the light of the world. I am the door. I am the good shepherd. I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the true vine. And here in our text, I am the resurrection and the life. What does he mean by this? Well, let's package this up. In verse 24, Martha, this lady, mourning the loss of her brother, shows that she saw the resurrection from the dead as a future event. 
sometime out in the future, one day this will take place. I'm not sure how, I'm not sure when, but yes, Lord, I believe one day the event is coming. And what Jesus is claiming here is so that it is to help her not think that the resurrection is a future event, but it is actually a present person. He, in essence, is saying, no, Martha. The resurrection isn't just something out there. It is something out there, but it's not just something out there. It is right here. I'm it. I am him. I am he. I am the resurrection and the life. This means this. Here it is. Ready? The power of the resurrection is found in him. This means that apart from Jesus, there is no resurrection and there is no life. Let me illustrate it this way. Years ago, there was a, a guy with white hair and a white goatee we know as Colonel Sanders. And he was the, the face of Kentucky Fried Chicken. When Kentucky Fried Chicken first came on the market, his mug was everywhere. He was smiling, and he was on advertisements and billboards and television. And he showed up with his finger licking good, finger licking good Kentucky Fried Chicken. Right? As, as irritating as that might be, he was the man of Kentucky Fried Chicken. Listen, at that time, there's better chicken out there now. I mean, let's just be honest. But this so caught the market at the time that it would have been quite conceivable for Colonel Sanders and his famous Kentucky Fried Finger Licking Good Chicken to say something like, I am Kentucky Fried Chicken. He could have said that, right? Everybody would have understood what he meant. He wouldn't have been saying, I literally am a chicken that's been fried in Kentucky. Cluck, cluck, cluck. That's not what he's saying. He's saying, without me, without me, I am so identified with Kentucky Fried Chicken that apart from me, there is no Kentucky Fried Chicken. There are fake claims. There are surrogates. But reality is, if you want Kentucky Fried Finger Licking Good Chicken, you must get chicken from me. I am fried chicken. Get it? Okay, so here's what Jesus means when he says, I am resurrection and life. Connect that. I am so narrowly and exclusively the provider of resurrection and life that apart from me, there is no resurrection and life. There is no other source of resurrection and life. I am it. So what D.A. Carson says Jesus is doing here is diverting attention from a generalized belief as to what takes place on the last day to himself. He's not offering the comfort of saying, yes, my dear sister, there is a resurrection on the last day. He is saying, I want you to believe something more than that, that I am the resurrection and the life. I am the resurrection and the life. He's doing this. He's taking the future promise of resurrection, the past hurt of Martha and Mary's experience with the loss of her brother, and he's bringing them together in a person named Jesus saying, I am the fulfillment of that. I am the power behind that. Now think about this with me. Wouldn't this claim be ridiculously uh, pathetic if he never actually rose himself from the dead? Like if Jesus says, I'm the resurrection and the life and his body's still in the grave, we'd be like, yeah, that was a, that was a, a, a false claim. But we believe that he did rise from the dead and there's lots of proofs from them. I'm not sure what this crowd is. If you need all my proofs, well, let me give you a couple. Jesus' own claim that he would rise from the dead. Listen, this may not do anything for you, but think about this. There are many people, even those who reject the resurrection of Jesus, who want to honor Jesus as a man of integrity and a faithful leader. But his integrity and his faithfulness must come into question if he went around saying that he was going to rise from the dead, but he really didn't. He would be a lunatic. It's hard to honor Jesus as an honest and good man or a psychologically healthy man if we reject him as the risen son of God. The empty tomb also is the other proof in the inability to produce a body. Think about this. The tomb where he was buried was empty on the third day, and the enemies of Jesus never could produce the body. Even though that would have ended the new movement, the Christianity movement, we would not be here today. We'd all be at the beach or somewhere else if all they did was exhume the body, put it on a stake in the middle of town, and say, he's not alive. Look at him. There's his body. But they never did. They had to come up with lies like, well, the disciples stole him or he swooned and all these weird things that really is impossible for us to come to grips with. 
not only that, think about the dramatic change in the disciples. His followers were a group of people that when he died on Good Friday, or as we celebrated on Good Friday and Friday and Saturday, they were afraid, they were scared, they were timid, they were about to forsake all that they had followed for the last three years and go back to fishing. And yet then just a couple weeks later, they became empowered with and lit on fire with the message of the gospel, so much so that it was said of them, they turned the world upside down. Something significant happened historically in these men that turned them from timid uh, timid weaklings into powerhouses of the gospel. What was it? They saw Jesus. The numerous eyewitnesses. Think about this. When Jesus rose from the dead in 1 Corinthians 15, Paul says that over 500 people in Jerusalem saw him. 500 in Jerusalem. Think about how that would be. If you, if you want to fake your life or fake your resurrection, uh, you're not going to go show yourself around to 500 people in the town where you were buried and, and where you were crucified. But only that, 20 years later, many of them were still claiming, still claiming Jesus was witnessed. He was seen. And many of them died and were killed and were martyred for the reality that Jesus was alive. All they would have had to do is say, no, we forsake that reality if this was a lie. The integrity and the reliability of these witnesses is what really is a profound life-changing reality. Think about the life-changing power of Jesus today. The fact that your life has been transformed. You have been given new life and new hope and new transformation because of the power, supernatural, unexplainable power of the Spirit of God in you because Jesus Christ is alive. Listen, why waste our time if all of these proofs are fake? If Jesus is dead, let's not even be believers in a God. Let's just be atheists and let's just go live our best life now because this is all we've got, right? But Jesus is alive. Jesus is alive. He did rise again. He did come out proving that he had the right and the power to declare, I am the resurrection and the life. Apart from me, there is no resurrection and there is no life. You see that? It's super quiet in here. I'm not sure if we're on the same page or not. It's a little unnerving, but we're okay. We'll get there. Offering hope in the face of death. Number one, Jesus presents a claim. He is saying, apart from me, there is no resurrection and there is no life. Because he makes that claim, number two, he also then presents a promise. Look at it. Whoever believes in me, though he die. Yet shall he live, and everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Guys, listen, lean in here. Because he is the the resurrection and the life, he can make a significant promise that has two parts. First, here's his promise. Listen, where there is death, I resurrect people who believe in me. I am the resurrection. Therefore, he who believes in me will live even though he dies. Like, is that paradoxical to our understanding? Yes. In other words... Because I am the resurrection, those who believe in me, death is not the final word in their existence. Even if you die, you will live. There is resurrection beyond death. This is a reference to the future final resurrection of all believers at the last day. The promise to those who believe in him is that even though they die, they will live again. Look at this text, 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 16. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of an archangel, and with the sound of the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. This is a future resurrection promise that has weight because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now, there's another more scary promise to those who will not believe in Jesus. This is a promise to those who believe in Jesus. But there's another one in John chapter 5. Look at this, verse 28 and 29. Here's what it says. Do not marvel at this. For an hour is coming when all who are in the tombs will hear his voice and come out. Those who have done good to the resurrection of life and those who have done evil to the resurrection of judgment. The good there is belief in Jesus. The wrong or the evil is the rejection of Jesus Those who believe in Jesus will be called to rise and enter into life. And those who have rejected Jesus will be called to live again, to enter into eternal judgment. It's heavy, I know, but that's what makes the resurrection so beautiful. Now he makes a second element to that promise when he says, look at it again in verse 26. Everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. So I am life. I give eternal 
life. Whoever lives and believes in me will never die. The logic here is this. He who believes in me will be resurrected again from the dead to life. And he who is alive because of the resurrection will never die again. This is eternal life, life that never ends. It goes on and on and on. There may be physical death that you pass by now, but because he is the life, we will be resurrected in believing in him and enter into eternal life. John 3, 16, look at it. This is the most famous verse in all the world. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him, believes in Jesus, the resurrection and the life, should not perish will not perish again. They will be resurrected to, he says it there, have eternal life. And there are two significant promises made from he who is the resurrection and the life. And the promise is, is that he will raise up from the dead those who believe in him and they will never die again, but have eternal life. Wow. You see why this is a big deal? We're, we all are going to deal with death. We're all going to face death. What about after that? Then what? Well, those who believe, according to the words of Jesus, he's either a lunatic or a savior to be trusted. And if he's a savior to be trusted, then what he's saying is that if you believe in Jesus, you have the hope of resurrection to eternal life. And if you don't believe in Jesus, you have the hope of resurrection only to be met with eternal judgment. But here's the reality is that this leads into eternal life. I want you to see this verse. I love this. The trumpet will sound. This is 1 Corinthians 15, 52 and 53. For the trumpet will sound. This is in the end. The dead will be raised imperishable and shall be changed. For this perishable body must put on the imperishable and this mortal must put on immortality. Aren't you looking for the day when you don't sleep and then wake up hurting? Aren't you looking forward to the day where nobody can tell you, uh, say anything about your, your pulled hammy? Or the fact you rolled your ankle or the fact that somebody called you and said, hey, I got bad news from the doctor today. Or, hey, I just wanted you to know uh, so-and-so passed this afternoon. Listen, this is what he's talking about. This perishing body that's going to die will put on imperishable characteristics and will never die. Is that a far out claim? Yes, if it's not in the Bible. Yes, if Jesus is a liar. Yes, it's a far out claim if Jesus is still dead. Yes, we should close up shop, sell the building and go do something else. But he is alive. Therefore, we take promises like this and say, take it to the bank, right? There's nothing worse than somebody who makes a promise that lacks the ability or the authority to deliver on that promise, right? Like people who say, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be there at such and such a time, and then they don't show up. You're like, what the heck? Like there's nothing worse than that. Or some guy that you thought was powerful enough to offer you something in a store, some discount, and you get it up to the top and the front, and the manager's like, he doesn't possess the power or authority to give you that discount. Sorry, right? There's nothing worse than that. That's an irritating situation. But here's the thing. By rising from the dead on that Sunday morning, Jesus proved that he possessed the power and the authority to make good on these promises. This is why we celebrate the resurrection with arms raised and voices loud and guts hanging out by just yelling and singing and praising God. That's why. If he did not rise again, if he's still in the grave, then we must conclude that Jesus made empty promises because he did not possess the power nor the authority to give and that he is a crazy man who lied and deserved the death he died. Do not insult us by leaving here rejecting Jesus but claiming that he's a good man. Because he is either rejected and a liar who deserved his death or he is who he says he is and deserves your full trust and faith. Apart from Jesus, there is no resurrection in life. So death is the final event for all mankind. But Jesus is the resurrection and the life. So he has the power to raise the dead on that day and give eternal life. Now, there's one last statement he makes, and we're done. It's simple. It's, it's, it's four words. It's this. Jesus presents a question. He looks to Martha, and he asks this. Do you believe this? He, he doesn't say to her, do you feel better now, Martha? Have you found these thoughts of mine comforting? Do you feel that your old optimism is returning? According to Jesus, it was not how she felt that was important, but what she believed. Listen, I hope you leave here feeling encouraged, but I'm not as worried about how you leave here feeling as much as I am how you leave here believing in Jesus. Jesus didn't ask, Martha, what does your sister think about all this? He didn't say, Martha, what are the newspapers writing about me these days? He doesn't say, Martha, read the comments on social media. Tell me what they're saying. 
He doesn't say, what are the scribes and religious leaders in the synagogue saying about me? He looks to Martha and he says, you, Martha, do you believe this? He's not asking if she believes that he's about to raise her brother from the dead, but he's asking if her faith can go beyond the quiet confidence that her brother will be resurrected at the last day to a personal belief and trust in Jesus as the resurrection and the life. Do you, Martha, believe that I am the only person who can grant eternal life and the promise of transformation at resurrection? Are you, can you believe that? The focus of Martha's and all of our faith must not be on a principle, but in a person. Don't just believe the fact that resurrection is coming. Believe in the fact that there is one who is the resurrection and the life. And the future event of resurrection is possible not because we believe it, but because we believe in the person who is the power of the future resurrection. Jesus is asking Martha, do you believe this? What is this? It's that. It's that, it's that he is who he says he is. And she says in verse 27, yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the son of God who is coming into the world. Now, don't be misled. Whether or not you believe this has no effect on whether or not it is true. There will be a resurrection, whether you believe it or not. Resurrection is not a matter of choice. It's not like, no, I'm good. I pass on that. No, he's clear. Jesus is clear. The word is clear. All will be resurrected. You will either be resurrected to eternal life or resurrected to be judged. All will die, will be raised, some to eternal life and some to judgment. The only relevant question is the question he asked Martha. Listen, lean into this. Do you believe? According to the text, those who believe will possess the hope of the future resurrection. John 3.36 says it this way. Whoever believes in the Son, the resurrection and the life, has eternal life. But whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life but the wrath of God remains on him. And I love you enough to be celebrating with you that Jesus is alive, therefore you have hope. And I love you enough to tell you I'm celebrating that you can come to this hope by placing your faith and trust in Jesus. Look at one more verse and we're done. John, uh, Romans chapter 10, verse 9 and 9 through 13. Here, here's, here's how Paul says it. Listen, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. That's awesome. I confess with my mouth, Jesus is Lord. That's me believing that Jesus is the resurrection and the life. And in my heart, I am believing that God did raise him from the dead. Therefore, he is the resurrection and the life. For with the heart, one believes and is justified. And with the mouth, one confesses and is saved. But the scripture says, everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame. They will not live in judgment. They won't regret it. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. For the same Lord is Lord of all, bestowing his riches of eternal life on all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Because I don't know how you got here. I don't know why you're here. I don't know the story of each of your individual respective lives. But I know one thing about you, that you will face death one day. How are you coping with it? Does Easter celebration mean more to you because you're aware of the death that is awaiting you? And because Jesus is alive, you know now that you have hope of life. Do you believe? Do you believe that he is the resurrection and the life? He's alive. Beloved, he's alive and there is hope. He makes a claim, yes, he makes a claim that he is the resurrection and life, but he backed up that claim by being the resurrection and offering life. In fact, later on in the story, he raised Lazarus up from the dead, proving that he has the power to do so, that he possesses the power. And so he asked that question. For me, that question hit me hard when I was 13 years old in 19, I don't remember what year it was now, but in the 1900s, okay, so... <laughs> I was in Flagstaff, Arizona. The Spirit of God came and pressed upon me my need for a Savior. I remember going up into the front of a room where there was a prayer team, and I remember his name, Jimmy Sparrow, took me to the corner of this auditorium, and he was my youth leader, and he said, Andrew, you know what to pray, and I just, I literally, I did I did Romans chapter 10, verse 9. I said, God, I believe Jesus died for me, and I need you to save me. Tears coming down my face. I, tears aren't a prerequisite. 
but I did because I was no, aware of the reality that, listen, without Jesus, I don't have the resurrection in the life. I don't have a hope. And it was that day in the corner of that room off to the side of an old rickety log uh, auditorium, I cried out with my mouth and believed in my heart that Jesus was alive and he was, listen, the only source of resurrection and life and hope. And I called out to him. And from that day, I've never been the same. Listen, I've not been perfect, far from it. In fact, very much not so. That's why we have dysfunctions all over the church, but I've never been the same because now I live with the hope that one day there is a resurrection and a life that awaits me because of what Jesus did when he saved me. You can today too. The Spirit of God may be showing you, I've never done that. I've never called on him. Because Jesus is alive, there's hope in the face of death. I don't have that hope. But if you believe in your heart, confess with your mouth, according to Romans, according to Paul, the Spirit of God does something in you. And if you will call because of the work that he's doing in you, you will be saved.